Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at uh, the person of Eve, Adam and Eve, and how Eve and the church share many of the same traits um, back when Eve was perfect in, in every way at the beginning of creation. And the traits foreshadowed the beauty of the church um, as seen through God's viewpoint. You know, the traits that he sees in us as his bride, as the body of Christ. And from here, we're going to go and we're going to look at several other women throughout the scriptures and how they foreshadow different aspects of the church today. And today we're going to be taking an overview, overview look of Sarah, who was the wife of Abraham from Genesis chapter 11 through 20. And before God changed their names, Abraham and Sarah were known as Abram and Sarai. And here was this couple that, that God had brought together, and, and, and they were married, but they were not complete as a unit. Because, according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 30, it says that Sarah was unable to conceive. And so that inability to have a child in that, that day and age uh, brought disgrace upon Sarah and upon the family as well. So, in essence, they were, they were incomplete because, because of that disgrace and because of um, just not being able to be a full family. And so we move on into Genesis 12, and we read, this is where we read that God calls Abram um, to go to a land that he, that he will soon show him. And, and he tells Abram to leave his country and his people and his father's household and to go to a land that I will show you. He didn't give him the final destination, uh, but just asked Abram or told Abram, to go, to leave his country, and Abram followed, and he did. He did what God asked him to do. He went along with his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all the possessions that he had accumulated and the people that he had acquired over the years. And so he went on their, that journey to wherever God was going to take them. Well, on this journey, uh, in Genesis 12, we see that... Um, Abram was kind of fearful of these new places that he was going to because of the beauty of Sarai, his bride. Even at the age of 65, Sarai would have been 65 years old, and, and they would go into these new areas, these new um, kingdoms. And, and, and Abram would tell Sarai, hey, whenever we see the officials there or the people that come there, just tell them you're my sister and not my wife. <clears throat> that, way, that way we will be treated better. Because if they see your beauty and they know that we're married, they're going to come and kill me so that they can have you. So he, he was concerned about that. So just told Sarai to say that she was his sister so that his life would be spared and all would go well for them. Then we get into Genesis 15. And this is where God gives Abram the promise of a child. Even though at this point, you know, Sarai was 65 in, in Genesis 12, and, uh, and they still hadn't been able to conceive a child. And yet God gives Abram a promise that there was going to be a child and that there was a promise that his family was going to increase. Instead of having to turn his inheritance, all that he accumulated, over to uh, a distant relative, that he was going to, Abram was going to be able to have a son of his own flesh and blood who would be the heir to all of his possessions. And from this child would come a family as numerous as the stars in the sky. And it was at this promise where Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so in Genesis 16, we find that Sarai knew about the promise that was given to Abram about having a child, but she took things into her own hands. She did, did things on her own. At this time, Abram would have been 85 years old, and so Sarai would have been 75. And because of her age and her inability to conceive a child, and in view of the promise that was given to Abraham, Sarai got her maidservant, Hagar, 
and gave her to Abram so that they could have a child together, so that God's promise would be fulfilled, not through Sarai, but through Hagar. Well, God allowed this child to be born. Ishmael was his name. And even though the promise was not going to be God's ultimate promise, was not going to come through Hagar and Ishmael, God did promise Hagar that her family, Ishmael's family, her descendants would increase. And they were going to be too numerous to count, just like Sarah's, Sarai's child once she would have him. However, the child that was born to Abraham, Abram through Hagar um, would live in hostility towards all people uh, for, the, for the remainder of, of their lives. And we see that today in the Middle East. And that was Genesis 16. Genesis 17, God continues to make a covenant with Abram to greatly increase his numbers, uh, that he was going to be the father of many nations. And it was this, at this time that God changed Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai, Sarai's name to Sarah. And God's covenant to Abraham involved the blessing through Sarah. You know, Hagar had Ishmael, and through Ishmael was going to come a great nation. But the promise that God had given was to come from through Abraham, through Sarah and her child. She was going to be the mother of, of nations, and many and kings of all of many peoples were going to come from her. And at this covenant, Abraham laughed to himself and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? Well, in Genesis 18, that promise continues. And we see the story of how the Lord appeared to, to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre through three men that came nearby. And these men were apparently of God, and they were angels of God. And in this interaction, one of these angels, one of these men said to Abraham, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah, she was listening. She was at the, the, the entrance to the tent. And she heard this conversation between Abraham and these, these men. And she laughed at the thought of having a child. She was beyond childbearing years and said, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Well, this promise brought about a restoration for Sarah. We come to Genesis 20, and we see that she is finally or fully restored physically and relationally. Because they're still in their journey, and Abraham and Sarah, they're going into another kingdom, another land. And he does the same thing that he did back in Genesis 12, where he was fearful of Sarah's beauty. That he tells her, or he tells the rulers there, that she is my sister. And at that, at that comment, the king, Abimelech, sends for Sarah and takes her to himself. Now consider this. Now, I don't know what it was like when, back in that day. I don't know what it was like. Uh, you know, I think Abram, Abraham lived to be 175 or something like that. And Sarah lived to be, I believe, 127. And so maybe at 90 years old, they still look pretty good. Or was it God had brought restoration to her physically? Physically, in beauty, in looks that Abimelech wanted this 90-year-old woman to be part of his harem, his concubines. But also there was that restoration that came that she was able to conceive a child and to have a child after her childbearing age had passed. And so there was that restoration, that physical restoration of her beauty and, uh, you know, so when Abimelech took Sarah to himself, he quickly found out that through a dream that God had given him that he did the wrong thing. And so he, he didn't touch Sarah, nothing happened there, and he gave her back to Abraham and along with many other things. Uh, but another aspect of 
the physical res restoration was the relational restoration. Because remember, when they were unable to conceive, that brought, that brought disgrace on the family because she was unable to have a child. Well, now she was able to conceive and she was going to give birth to a son. And that brought restoration to the relationships. She was now restored fully and made complete through the promise that God had given to her. Now, what does all this mean for us today? Well, Abram and Sarai, they were incomplete because of that inability to have a child. Well, in a similar way, number one for us is we are incomplete because we are born into sin. We are incomplete from the beginning, from the moment we step into this world, come into this world, we are incomplete because of sin. Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, Adam and Eve, when God created them at the beginning of time, they were perfect in every way. Until the serpent came and deceived them. And because of that deception, through that deception, sin entered the world. And because of that, all who enter into the world are born into sin. And we're incomplete because of that severed relationship with God. And even though that relationship with God is severed because of sin, we still have hope. You know, in their incomplete state, Abram and Sarai, they were given a promise of a child. They were given hope that something was going to come in the end. And in a similar way, number two, we have been given a promise of new life. John 3.16, familiar verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You know, we, are, we have that separation from God. We are, we are incomplete because of sin, and that relationship is severed. But we have a promise that God loved us so much that through his son, by believing in him and what he accomplished on the cross, we can have eternal life. Even though we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, he has given us a lifeline. God sent his son into the world to make right all that went wrong in the Garden of Eden. And by his son, we now have the promise of life. If we will believe in and call on the name of Jesus. And we also have to realize that this promise is based on faith. You know, the child Abraham and Sarah received was simply a gift from God. It wasn't by their own efforts. It was a gift. And again, in the same way, number three, the life we receive, that eternal life that we receive is God's gift to us. Scripture tells us, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You know, it's important for us to realize that the gift of eternal life, that gift that God gives to us, is given by grace and not by works. How important that is for us to, to remember and to grab hold of. You know, when Abraham believed in God's plan to, to give him a child, it was credited to him as righteousness. However, when Sarah took matters into her own hands, it brought about unintended results. You know, we tried to, she was trying to do things by her own abilities, by her own efforts, rather than totally relying on God. And so God allowed Sarah to make things happen. But it caused tension with the, that family, with Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. It caused tension with them from the very beginning, but it ca still causes tension today in the Middle East and all around the world. You know, the gift of salvation we receive is a gift from God through faith. And many times we, we try to earn that salvation. 
you know, their, that gift uh, through the actions that we do. Many times we require certain things of other people, maybe for ourselves, for us to actually receive and accept the gift that was given, that we are saying, look what I have done. We require those certain things, but God's gift is ours for the taking by simply believing in the work completed through Jesus. And when Abraham and Sarah heard God's plan to give them a child at their advanced age, they both laughed. They laughed at the idea, the thought of having a child at that age. You know, God's plan for them seemed ludicrous and simply impossible, but God is in the business of doing the impossible. And for many people, the thought of salvation, being saved by the grace of God, seems ludicrous and even impossible because of the way we have lived our lives, uh, how long we have stayed away from God. But the truth is, number four, God gives life to anyone who calls on his name. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, in other words, even though we messed up in our past, even though we are messing up today, even though we will mess up in the future, Jesus still died for our salvation. It doesn't matter how bad we've been. It doesn't matter um, how long we've stayed away from him. No matter how far we have fallen, how long we have waited to come to know him or to accept him, we are still loved by God. And the life God has for us is always available to those who will simply call on his name. You know, I, I know there's people out there, we, you talk to them about salvation and they laugh because they know the life that they've lived. But that doesn't matter. It's a gift from God. By, through grace, by grace, the grace of God through faith. And so that, that life that he wants to give is to anyone who calls on his name. And finally, the work of God in the lives of Abraham and Sarah brought about restoration. And in a similar, similar way, we are restored. Number five, we are restored through the work of Christ. Scripture tells us that in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, think about that. Talk about complete restoration. All the sins that we have committed throughout our years, they've all been eradicated. The Bible states, uh, David wrote in Psalm 103, he says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. So that idea that we are restored. No matter what the sins are in our lives, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ, who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, Scripture tells us if we sin at one part of the law, we've broken the whole thing. And that's just not from the moment we're saved until we enter into eternity. It's our entire lives. If we have failed in one part of the law in our entire lives we've broken the entire law and we are we deserve death but through Christ there is now no condemnation meaning our sins are taken away and i love that picture as far as the east is from the west is what how far god separates us from our sins and you think about that in our world when you start heading east you will never head west you will continually head east. When you head west, you'll continually head west. It'll never end. But if you head north and you get to the North Pole, what happens? 
you start going south. And when you get to the South Pole, you start going north. And so that image of when, when as far as the east is from the west, they never come together. And that's how far God has moved our, removed our transgressions, our sins from us. The work of Christ completely separates us from our sins. There's now no condemnation for our sins are no longer counted against us. The disgrace of sin is taken away and we are completely restored to what God desired from the very beginning at creation. We all fall short of his best, but through Christ, we have been made perfect, even as we continue to strive for that protection, perfection. That's who we are as his bride, as his church. We are the restored children of God. Next week, we're going to continue looking at the foreshadowing of the bride of Christ, of which we are a part. And next week, we're going to be looking at the story of Isaac and Rebekah, found in Genesis 24. So take some time. Read that this week, and and, uh, we will discuss that next week. God bless you. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time. 